All right, we've talked a little bit about um, kind of the historical view of the atom and actually what the atom is and a few points of, of, of Dal John Dalton's theory. What we need to talk about now are the actual portions of an atom. Um, John Dalton thought that atoms were indivisible, but current investigators in the late 1800s um, proved otherwise. As scientific advances allowed a deeper exploration of matter, it became clear that atoms are actually composed of several basic types of smaller particles. Um, that's what we consider uh, our subatomic particles. So let's talk about the first subatomic particle. And by far the most important subatomic particle because that's actually what makes chemistry chemistry uh, in, in most situations. The electron. In 1897 there was an English physicist named J.J. Thompson. He used a cathode ray tube. Some of you may be familiar with the um, cathode ray tube. In like an old TV, they used to have tubes that produce uh, the light so that we could see. And what it is is it's an evacuated tube that you can um, pass a current through. It's a vacuum tube. All the air has been sucked out or, or pumped out. We don't science doesn't suck. We use a push or pull. All the um, air has been pulled out and replaced with a low pressure gas. For example, a um, not a, like a noble gas, like xenon. If you can think of a xenon or a neon type sign, that's a vacuum tube. That's kind of like a cathode ray tube. Um, we see cathode ray tubes used in TVs as well as monitors. The old monitors that you see uh, that computers worked up with is they called them CRT monitors or cathode ray tube monitors. All right, this is kind of what Thompson had. He had a cathode ray tube, which he was passing a current through. These lines represent a current. This is your voltage source. Your current is flowing. Okay. As the electric current was passed through the tube from the cathode, the negative electron, to the anode, the positive electrode, he noticed something. He took a, It was illuminated. It looks very similar to a neon sign. He took a bar magnet to this. And, or and added an electric field by using a magnet. Now we know that we've seen magnets with positive ends and uh, negative ends or north and south ends. Well what J.J. Thompson did is he took and he took a positive end of a magnet and a negative end of a magnet and he put it on this field. He noticed that the stream of electrons or the stream of light was drawn towards the positive uh, end of the magnet and away from the negative end of the magnet. So if something, we know that like charges do what? They repel and opposite charges attract. So the particles that were in this evacuated gas tube, or these light particles, must have been negative. So J.J. Thompson determined that electrons have a very high negative charge and a very low mass. J.J. Thompson used his theory to develop what we now know as the plum pudding model, or uh, think of it as kind of like, um, I almost consider like a rice and gravy type model, where the gravy is holding all the rice together, and the, neg and the rice is the little negative parts, or like rice pudding. Um, they ate a lot of plum, and probably still eat a lot of plum pudding in uh, Europe. What he said was that an atom is made of negative particles, okay, like the plums or the rice and rice and gravy, surrounded by a positive material with the mass and charges uniformly distributed. All right, just like um, kind of rice and gravy, you had these negative chunks or the rice surrounded by this gravy, and this gravy was kind of holding it all together because they were opposite charges; they were being held all together and the charge was evenly distributed throughout so it would stay all together now in 18, oops, sorry, 1909 uh, an American physicist named Robert Millikan uh, performed what we know as Millikan's oil drop experiment he confirmed that the electron has the smallest possible negative charge and that all other negative charges are whole number multiples of that charge of the electron so what did Millikan do? All right, this is Millikan's oil drop experiment. Okay, he had oil in an atomizer. Okay, you may remember, or you may have seen an atomizer on um, 
TV, these older people use it to put the perfume on. What it does is it takes um, a perfume or water, or in this case oil, and makes it into a fine mist. He put that fine mist in between, uh, or those fine oil droplets, in between two plates. Okay? He sprayed it in between these two plates. This top plate had a hole in it, and he had a telescope where he could monitor, or he, where he could observe the droplets. What he did was he adjusted the charge of these two plates so where he could, to where he could levitate the oil droplets in between it. By calculating the charge, or that charge that he put between those two plates, or the difference in charge, he was able to determine that the electron has a very, uh, is very negative, and exactly what the negative charge was through some uh, extrapolation of data. Now, Rutherford, 1910. Ernest Rutherford is, again, an English physicist, and he believed in J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom. And he wanted to confirm. Remember, in science, scientific method, we're always trying to either confirm or uh, disprove others' scientific tests. So what he did, what Rutherford did, was he tries to, tried to use radioactivity in order to test this theory, this plum pudding model model. What he did was he used alpha particles, which are positively charged pieces given off by uranium, and shot them at a thin gold foil. Okay. What he expected to happen was to have these positively charged molecules go straight through this foil. So let's kind of take a look at what he had. Alright, I like to call this uranium cannon, or an alpha, alpha particle cannon. Alright, uranium gives off alpha particles in its... Um, uh, as it decays. This lead block is protecting not only Rutherford, but it's also able to channel where those alpha particles are giving off. He's going to shoot those alpha particles at this thin gold foil. Then around this thin gold foil, he has a phosphorescent screen. When alpha particles come in contact with the fluorescent screen, they um, glow. The fluorescent screen will change colors and glow. Uh, he expects alpha particles to pass straight through without changing direction very much but the positive particles were spread but, but because the positive particles were spread out evenly alone they were not enough to stop the alpha particles so you've got this plum pudding model where you have everything being held together by the opposite charges evenly distributed he said these alpha particles should go straight through now this is what exactly what he was thinking at the molecular level he said these positively charged alpha particles um, are going to go straight through these atoms. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, he got quite a different result. When he shot the alpha particles, the majority of them did go straight through. But, he noticed something else. He had a few go to the side, a few go even further, and some were flat out repelled back the opposite direction. So let's kind of take a look and see what's going on at the molecular level. Most of the particles pass through the foil indicating the atom is mostly empty space. Okay, we now have one atom here. Very few of the particles bounce back, but when they did they bounced back with great force or were deflected with the great force. So this is what um, Rutherford, or this is how Rutherford explained it. He said that the atom is mostly empty space. There's a small, dense, positive piece at its center. And it is called the nucleus. Right? In 1919, Rutherford discovered the proton. The neutron was discovered in 1932 by an English physicist named James Chadwick. His experiment is not overly exciting um, to talk about, so we're just going to skip it because, I mean, neutron, it's kind of difficult to determine the neutron. He had to figure something else was holding it together, um, which he determined it was going to be nuclear forces. So that's kind of an overview of how the three subatomic particles that we know today have evolved and become our uh, standard for atomic theory.